Good evening, everyone. Good evening. What a privilege it is for me to be here uh, to share this moment with you. And I just pray that the time that we spend together would be a God moment for all of you. Amen? Amen. This, for the next couple of days, uh, starting tonight, we're going to pursue something that, that's one of the most important things in our lives. So I entitled it, The Most Important Pursuits of Our Lives. Because all of us are pursuing something. Sometimes we don't know what we're pursuing after, but sometimes we know what we are pursuing after, but we don't know how to get there. And so there's a sense of lostness as to what we are pursuing after, or if we know, uh, we just don't know how to get there sometimes. And I think the Bible is very, very clear and so powerful in that it teaches us what's important. You know, knowing what's important is very important, isn't it? You know, Stephen Covey, uh, Stephen Covey says something really powerful when it comes to importance. He says, it says, the main thing in life is to keep the main thing as the main thing. <laughs> you know, I wish I had said it. But the more I think about what he said, it really makes sense. Because in life, no matter how much we put our emphasis on things that we think important, but if it is not something that's significant, if it's not something that's most important, no matter how much effort we put into it, no matter how much you know, education we put into it, no matter how much time we put into it, no matter how much you know, energy we put into it, it doesn't make what's less important, important. And one of the most devastating things that we can experience in life is to be at the end of life and realizing that what you thought to be the most important is not that important. And somehow you feel like you are cheated on life. Either by somebody else or by your own misunderstanding or by mis application of God's word. And that's why it is so important to realize when the Bible says Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 it says, seek ye first the what? Kingdom of God. And you see, seeking, knowing the reason why you and I are here seeking God because without seeking God, we would not know what really matters. Because we only go through life once. And therefore, we cannot afford making mistakes in realizing what's important, what really matters. So, for the next couple of days, I would like to spend time with you in honest conversation with you as to what really life is all about, what really matters in the end, and what makes life important, what makes life significant, and what do we need to pursue after with a limited amount of time, with a limited amount of energy and resources that we have. How many of us here recognize that you come here to realize once again, to be more than for sure, and to know what's important in life, and to give you everything to pursue what, what is going to not only matter, but what is going to fulfill you in such a way that God has designed for us to be fulfilled. Amen? Amen. Why don't we take a moment to pray together before I share the message. Dear Father, I know that it is you who have brought these precious people here in this place. I know that more people are coming as well. I know that there are some who are tugged by the Holy Spirit and they are on the verge of making decision to come. But for those who are here, they are led by God to be here. And so we want to recognize you and your power, your existence, the power of the Holy Spirit, 
that can touch the hearts of people in ways that human agency can't. And so we would like to ask you to lead. We would like to ask you to be the main character in this platform. And I want your word to be spoken. And I want your conviction to be given and shared. But most of all tonight, I want your love to be vindicated, love to be experienced, and love to be shared in the lives of people tonight. I pray that you would reveal yourself to us tonight as we seek you with all our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tonight I want to talk about what it means to be human. What it means to be human and what it means to know God. And number one thing about being human is that we are made to be connected. We are made to be connected. You see, first of all, even before you were born, you know, when you were in mother's womb, you know, you were connected to the mother. You know, physically, physically you were connected. And then you received nutrition from the mother. And it is interesting how you and I were born in the warm water, which represents the Holy Spirit, you know? And I want us to realize tonight that no matter where you've been, no matter where you are in your life, I want you to know that you and our lives are covered by the hovering and the embracing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then when you were born, I hope it was the case where you, when you were kissed and hugged, I mean, in a way that you could not imagine. I remember having our first child when she was born. I mean, it was a miracle child, right? And I thought, I thought having a child, you know, delivering a child was, was, a, was a short case. <laughs> and, and I didn't know that it would take longer than sometimes 12 hours. And my wife and I, we practiced, you know, we went to this kind of weird, uh, you know, class called the child birth class. Have you ever gone there? With the pillows? <laughs> And I went there, I took the class, and then my wife told me that, you know what? If I have a back pain, when I, if I have a back pain, then she wants me to uh, push her back with a, with a tennis ball. So we made sure that we had a tennis ball, and we practiced. And then one day I came home and I felt weird. I felt like something happened. And then, sure enough, I saw the sign on my doorpost, and he goes, Honey, hurry up, I went to the hospital to deliver a child. And so, I was driving to the hospital, it was a red signal all the way through. <laughs> and I was thinking that, you know what, I may, I may not be able to make it. Man, you know, how can I, how can I explain myself? So I went there, and thank goodness that delivery takes a long time. And it didn't even start it. And then she was start, sure enough, she was starting to have a back pain. And then I found myself pushing her back and going crazy pushing her. And then she was telling me that, you know, honey, I don't feel a thing. And when my hand was shivering like this. And then the, one of the African-American lady came in and she saw the, uh, you know, Tomo that was going on. And she goes, what's going on here? Oh, that's not the way to uh, push her. She came and she took, took the tennis ball with one hand and then started pushing her by saying, Wow, you're doing such a great job. It must be because of kimchi that you've been eating. <laughs> and then she was like, I'm, I'm already feeling better. I mean, when I try my best to push her uh, to a point where I, where I was starting to shiver, she didn't feel a thing, but when she received that word of encouragement, she began to feel better. And then we had a child after 12 hours later, and then in the process of having a child, she pushed in a wrong way. She ended up pushing upward, and then her like, blood vessels popped, and then 
I saw her four o'clock in the morning and her face was like kind of, you know, bloody. And I felt so bad and I was coming home and I said, you know what? When my child comes home and I'm going to treat her really well, I'm going to do my best to love her. That's how a child begins their lives, by being caressed and by being embraced. There's so much physical connection that are going on. You know, they did a study on monkeys. And you know what they found out? Is that even, even the monkeys need a physical connection. You know, they did a study on, on mother monkey and then the baby monkey and then the father monkey to put them together in a cage and then they put the, you know, they just cover except the breast of a mother, they cover other, other parts of her body and then to see how the baby would respond and they found out that this baby monkey would suck the milk from the mother and yet lean on the father to be caressed, to have that physical touch and connection. And what's so interesting is that, you know, as we are growing up as a child, we receive a lot of physical touch and physical connection. I don't know about your culture, but even in Korean culture, they receive a lot of physical touch. But then once you reach uh, up to a, like, a, you know, middle years, you start, you stop touching them. And they kind of stop touching you. Physical touch stops. And then once they reach the adult years, then we become very awkward when it comes to physical touch, right? I have a hilarious moment whenever I go to international Korean airport. Whenever I go to the international airport in LA, and I like go there sometime and I see Korean people kind of embracing each other, it's so hilarious. I don't know about your culture, but in our culture, as long as your, your families are far away from you, your bodies are very flexible, you're able to express your emotion, and they even go crazy like, hi, you know, oh, I'm glad you came. And then as they get come closer and closer and closer, your body gets stiffer, stiffer, stiffer. And then when they come right nearby you to a point where you can touch them, you know, with your hand, what happens? You become so stiff and then you end up like shaking their hands and then you walk out like a military, you know? It's so funny. And what's so interesting is that when we are a child, we receive a lot of physical touch and then when we grow up, it starts diminishing and diminishing and then Males begin to have this, you know, hormones raising. And then, only thing you know is to be connected physically. And then you end up thinking that, you know, physical connection is the way to receive love, way to have love. And so that you become physical. You know, these days, young people, this generation is a generation that is filled with false intimacy. Even though you start, you know, because you started with getting physical touch and you think somehow that, that being in touch with others physically is the way to get love. But what's interesting is that God made us in such a way that we need more than physical touch. Yes, we need physical touch, and that's why, that's why there's, a, there's a place for sexuality and all that, but we need more than physical touch. And let's move on to the next one. We are made to be connected emotionally, not just physically. It is important for us to, you know, touch each other in an appropriate manner, like through hug or through handshakes. And sometimes I like tapping on the shoulder of some people. And I know the kids need eight times of hug every day. So we need that physical connection. We need that stimulation. But it has to be appropriate. But we, we are made not to be just physical. We are made to have that emotional connection with people. What's so interesting is that when a baby is in mother's womb from the month of five to six months, this is fascinating. There is a sense of connection 
that a child begins to experience in mother's womb. Let's just move on very quickly. This is how the brain works, how the brain looks like. You know, your brain and my brain alike. There is no Korean brain and there is no Filipino brain. <laughs> All brains are pretty much the same. But what's interesting is that in our brain, we have four different parts. The front part called frontal lobe, and that's where the thinking comes in. You think, and then you have a will in your frontal lobe. Okay? You do all kinds of thought patterns that goes through your frontal lobe. And then in the middle of it, in the, in the middle of it, there is a emotional brain. Emotional brain is in the middle of it. And then what's so interesting about this emotional brain is that emotional brain is connected to your senses, your eyesight, and your feelings, and your audio, hearing, and touch, and everything is well woven and well connected to your emotional brain. And then, I'm going to come back to this emotional brain a little bit later. And then there is a hypothalamus which provides the balance. You know, if you are chased by a bear in the mountain, have you ever encountered a you know, bear in the mountain? And they survive? Yes, I experienced the bear, you know, uh, encounter in the mountain, Sierra Mountain. We went up there and the bear was coming. You know, I could hear they're huffing and puffing and they're going around our camp. And then my wife, without knowing it, she was going, Who is that? Who is that? Said, Be quiet, Jewel. <laughs> it's a bear. <laughs> And, and so, so I was looking up, you know, through my, uh, you know, the, the window of my tent, and then I found something fascinating. These three bears came, and they were trying to smell something. They, they thought that something, they knew that something was there. But luckily, we put all of our luggages on the tree, and smell something on the tree. So these bears are not that stupid, and they're resilient. And you know what they were doing? They were trying to get up there, and then they're squeezing down skating down and then they're trying going up there again they tried so many times and then they got some thinking and they decided you know what just trying to go up there is not going to work and then they're going to they try to go up as much as they could and before they fall down they flew and then they they hit one of the back with their hand stretched their hand and then one of the back came down and they start eating something and then right after that they're gone and the next day I went out there, sorry to make, it, make a gross kind of uh, description. When I out there, I saw so much, uh, you know, poos everywhere. They were making like diarrhea poos on the way. And then guess what I found? I found one of the hottest ramen, Korean shin ramen soup base was up there. <laughs> when you're chased by a bear, what do you do? You got to use your senses and everything, muster your, like, you know, you know, you know, you know, just extraordinary strength to be able to take off. Hypothalamus will provide it. And then, and then the next one is a basic stem that has to do with, with the breathing ability. But I want to tell you about the emotional brain that is in the middle of it. And in the middle of the emotional brain, there's a place called limbic system. Limbic system is like an emotional hard drive in that you start recording whatever this is striking. Whatever mother feels during that five to six month period time and on, whatever mother feels in a relationship with her husband gets recorded to the baby's limbic system. That's amazing isn't it? And this is the emotional hard drive. And so if a mother feels sad, then that sadness gets transmitted to a child and child gets sad for no reason. I think this is the reason why many times the first child has more issues than other kids in terms of emotionally. Because while the parents are busy adjusting to each other and sometimes causing fights and uproar in relationship and baby is getting affected by it in a very, very 
primitive and fundamental way. And that's why sometimes when you have a child come out of this world, you, you come out angry. And even if, and then and when, when the baby is in the mother's womb, if this is what's happening. When a baby hears something like a quick soprano sound, you know, high pitched sound, and she would go like, oh, I don't like that sound. When I get out, I don't think I will get along with that voice. And that voice ends up being your mom. And then when you're in mother's womb, then you hear a voice like a, like a really thick, you know, baritone or bass voice and always raising voices and always like stressed out. I don't like that voice. When I get out, I'm going to have issues with that voice. One time I was preaching in a church. That's why, the reason why I'm telling you these things is because, because our brokenness goes really, really deep. Even to a point where we don't even recognize and realize. One time I was preaching in a church out as a youth pastor. And there's a lady, there's a girl who always gets mad at me right after the sermon. Right after I finished my sermon, I would walk out, she would criticize me, she would make fun of me, and she would like, really like giving me hell. And I had no idea where she was coming from. And I was asking my wife, what should I do about that? And she goes, just leave her alone. I don't know. She may be anger based. Whoa, she was right. And three years later, I had to move on from that church without having been able to reconcile with her. Because I didn't know what to reconcile with her. And, and one day I was preaching at a church and then that lady, that anger-based girl showed up in our church. And I quickly adjust my voice and I had to lower my voice. And then right after the church, church, she came to me and said, Pastor Ram, I want to talk to you. And she said, do you remember a time when, Pastor, do you remember a time when I used to, you know, used to be our pastor and I used to get mad at you? I said, oh, I don't remember <laughs> very well. And she goes, you remember, don't lie, you remember. And then that's okay, Pastor, don't, don't worry about it. You know what happened? I went to counseling and I came to realize the reason why I got mad at you the way I did. And you know what she said? She said, Pastor Ram, you wouldn't believe what happened. Whenever you preach a sermon, whenever you get excited, whenever you, your voice goes up and, you know, not screaming but very excited, then your voice exactly becomes exactly like my father. And my father, he would get drunk and he would come home and then he would raise his boys and he would just like abuse us crazy. And whenever I'm sitting at church and listening to your sermon, whenever I was listening to you and somehow your voice triggered my father's abuse. That's why I ended up getting everything out on me. So I was like, are you telling me that I was, I, my voice sounded like being drunk? And then I quickly corrected my question by saying, maybe it's because I was drunk by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> anyway, she, she and I had a wonderful joining and now I understand where she was coming from, where the brokenness that, that she had to deal with. And I said, you know what, it is so amazing that you come and talk to me about it. It just, just give me tears for you to realize it, for you to ask for forgiveness. We reconcile. We become one. I, I care about you deeply for the healing that God has given to you. And she said, I didn't just come here to be forgiven. I came here to ask for something from you. 
And then I got nervous. And she goes, Pastor, you wouldn't believe that I, I was transformed, I was anger-based, I let go of that anger, and then God gave me love, love of my life. And, you know, the gentleman I brought is my fiancé. We're going to get married, and I want you to preside the wedding. And I said, what if you get mad in the middle of my homily? <laughs> no, it's bad service. <laughs> I am healed, so don't worry about it. I had a wonderful privilege of presiding the wedding for her, and I was almost in tears, recognizing what God has done for her in terms of healing. You know, I want you to know tonight that we all need this emotional connection and that the sense of connection that, that we need you know, existed from the, from the day one, from mother's womb, from five months and on. And yet, sometimes that, that connection is broken. Sometimes the emotional connection, where there's emotional connection, there's mistrust. When there's trust, there's mistrust. When we are made to be cared, when we are made to be connected physically and connected emotionally, that sense of connection is not there anymore. And there is a sense of disconnection. And there's a sense of deep mistrust. And then you begin to doubt about everything because you're so, you're so unloved, you're so uncared for as a child. You see, that's why when you grew up as a child, you start feeling everything. And then I want you to know tonight something very, very important. You get hurt in the realm of feeling. You get hurt in the realm of environment. You get hurt in the realm of audio and visual and even you know, in an area where it can be touched. So feeling of hurt is very real. Feeling of unlove is very real. The feeling of uncared for is very, very real. And hurt, don't lie. The hurted emotion, don't lie. It's there. And I want you to know that there's one gentleman who came to me for counseling because he's struggling with not being able to trust his wife. He has only one son and his wife. He said, I'm doubting everything about my wife. She is the best thing I can ever have, but I am doubting everything that she does for me. I don't know where it came from. And we researched it, we searched it, and then we go back to his childhood, and I came to realize that he was someone who was totally neglected and uncared for. When his diaper was wet, nobody was coming and changing it. And when he was crying for food, he would be left by himself for a long period of time. So he grew up and, you know, developing this mistrust. And mistrust turned into not only an anger, but anxiety and not being able to trust anybody. And then he got married and had a child. And can you imagine being married and your wife cooks for you? And he doesn't eat. He doesn't eat the food that she made because he literally believes that she might have put a poison in there. And so you know what he does? He allows, he allows, when the food is given to him, he allows his son to eat it first. And so after his son eats and he feels okay, then he eats. The more I study about human emotion, how we have been wounded from the day one, it really makes me, it really gives me the deeper sense of compassion on people. Because we are all broken one way or the other. Amen? And that's why God asks us to have compassion. Compassion. Compassion goes deeper than emotional connection. Compassion 
is on a spiritual realm. And that's what I want to talk about. You and I are not only made to be connected physically, and, and nowadays, People have such a rough idea when it comes to physical connection, thinking that when you are connected physically, you think that you have all the intimacy that you need, but that is a false sense of intimacy. Even though you study your life that way, that's not everything that you seek after to be connected. And I know men are very physical because that's the only way we know how to be connected. You know, man needs emotional connection, so we become physical. But woman needs to be connected, to be ready to be physical, and that's why they never meet. <laughs> it has a hard time. Man has a, man has a need to be connected, and they become physical and then you know woman gets turned off when man gets physical without having the emotional and spiritual dimension but I want to tell you tonight that we are not just made to be physical we're not just made to be emotional we're made to be spiritual we're spiritual people you know I, I almost want to say that even I know this is a controversial saying even the animals have the, the hint of what compassion look like. You go on YouTube, it's called Odd Animal Couples, right? My wife showed it to me. It is one of the most amazing, amazing documentary I ever seen. And let me tell you about a story about a goat and a horse. Can you imagine goat and a horse being friends to each other for 19 years? Because horse lost his eyesight. And this goat out of nowhere and came and they kind of grew up together and somehow this goat came to realize that she has a mission to live out. That is become an eye for the horse. Can you imagine? And so this goat is directing the horse to the water, to the grass. And she has been doing that for eight, nine, ten years. Same path to the water, same path to the grass. And after 19 years, to her sadness, this horse dies. And then here is this goat not only losing her companion, but losing sense of mission in life. And she would continue to go and repeat the route that she used to try so many times to take care of the horse. And then she became depressed. And then she died. Wow! Even animals are given with a spirit of compassion. That's amazing. Let me tell you one more story about the baboon in Africa. That's what we need to study about nature, young people. We need to study about nature. There's a baboon family in Africa, and then there's so much stress among baboon families. They're a big family making noises, and, and there's this definite sense of hierarchy. The meanest one is the head. <laughs> The second meanest one is next. They're so mean. Those heads are so mean. And everybody's stressed out. And one day, a very unusual kind of food became available. And then, this evil and very selfish leaders ended up eating all the food just by themselves. And then, luckily or not, they all died. All the bad ones gone. And then all the good ones left. <laughs> and then now, there's no longer hierarchy. Stress is gone. They're loving each other. They're caring for one another. And they're just so much compassion. I want to tell you tonight that we are made, we are made 
to be connected spiritually. You see, when I say that we are made to be connected spiritually, it means that we are made to love and to be loved, and, and we are made to have compassion for one another. We are made to be connected. You see, in order for me to have compassion for somebody else, I need to be so connected. You know, when my wife had a child, I was like, oh man, I feel so bad for my wife. And first of all, I said, I'm, thank God that I'm not a woman who has to bear a child. And secondly, I said, I felt so bad for my wife for bearing a child, for going to that extent, almost giving her everything to have a child. And I said, you know what, when she comes out, I'm going to treat her like a queen. Man, what happened to me? After three days, when she came out, that sense of special, you know, you know, desire to treat her well is gone. And then the time came and my wife wanted to go back to California to meet her family. And then I was like, when she comes back, I'm going to really treat her well. And then as soon as she comes back, you know, I lose that, that special heart that I, I thought I had for her. And I came to realize in my 20 years of marriage, compassion is not something that I can generate on my own, but compassion is God-given. Amen? It's, it's something that comes from God. And that's why we are made to be connected, what? Spiritually. You see, when we're talking about compassion, we're talking about more than emotional connection. We're talking about being connected heart to heart. You know, I have a gentleman in our church. I have young people in our... I'm starting a new church, so, so starting from nothing. And our church had no young people. It was pretty sad. I mean, I love seniors, don't get me wrong. I love, you know, Korean adults. But, but to have a church where, like, I had all the young people, all the children moving to a church where there's no young people and almost make me to be the youngest in the church with my white hair. And I was pretty sad. And I was determined to have some young people. I have a gentleman who started coming. Very, very special heart. This gentleman, this young, this young man, this young man is very, very special. I can't go into detail, but he would come to church if his mom asked him to come. I mean, who would come? Young people would come to church because mother asked him to come. But this guy comes to church. Even if he was late, he would come to church. He knows a lot about the car, so I got in touch with him. And, you know, I, I was talking to him because, you know, I was excited about the car knowledge that he had and, and all that stuff. And I started having conversation. And then I came to realize in my relationship with him that he had this spiritual need to be connected. When I say spiritual, let me tell you this. Did you know that we are made to communicate heart to heart. You know, you know I, I'm so thankful to God because, because of God, I am learning how to be connected, you know, spiritually. And I'm learning that even from my wife. I'm learning that from God and I'm learning that from the Word of God, learning that from Jesus Christ. And to be connected spiritually is to know how to communicate, how to dialogue. You see? Because, because, you know, there's something that we need when it comes to communication. So let me tell you. There's five levels of communication that goes deeper as you continue on. Okay? Let's start with a cliche. And I want you to take, a, take time to just greet each other. Just cliche. Greet each other. How are you? When you greet each other, when you say, how are you, you don't say, I had a bad day. You don't say that. One time, without understanding American culture, I thought, when I came to the United States, everyone was greeting me, how are you, how are you? And I said, wow, this is a Christian country. So one time I was uh, kind of joking about it. Somebody in the morning you know, asked me, how are you? I look around and said, my mother just passed away. And the guy goes, fine, have a great day. <laughs> 
You know, you don't, you're not supposed to spill your guts out when somebody asks you, how are you? It's a cliche. You just say, how are you? And fine. If you're not fine, you say, not bad, right? You don't say terrible. You don't do that. You know, it's not good etiquette. And the second cliche, you can only go so far by sharing this cliche kind of, you know, greeting. And oftentimes we come to church and all we have is cliche. How are you? Fine. How are you? Not bad. Every Sabbath you come to church, one with the same pew, and the next door neighbor, you just cliche. That's about it. You go a little bit deeper when it comes to communication, then you get to share information. This is where a lot of men stays. You know, men get together to talk about like who's winning the ball game, you know, they talk about those things. Well, ladies too, they get together like where they have the best shopping or, you know, best sales. <laughs> you know, when you share information, you can only go so far. And I often tell you that number two level of communication, it is like the communication you have on the elevator. You go on the elevator in that small, squished space, you go in and everyone's quiet and awkward, it's just all new people, and then there's always somebody who kind of breaks the silence, right? Isn't that a hot day today? And then you go, yeah, and then you look at your number and the number comes, you get out, right? And a lot of times, what, what is so sad is that even between parents and children, our communication stops on number two level. I don't know about other families, but in Korean family, my father used to come home and he asked me these two questions. Did you wash your feet? <laughs> I don't know why when we were single we smell that, but as soon as I married to my wife, that smell gone. I'm mad. Miracle happened. And so my father always asked me, like, did you wash your feet? <laughs> and the second thing that parents like to ask, like, did you do your homework? And then if, you, if our answer is yes or no, or you know, and a lot of our, and even husband and wife, oh, mother's birthday is coming up, and oh yeah, refrigerator is broken, let's fix it. When we um, just remain, our, when we allow our relationship to remain in a functional level, we, we stop at number two. Number two doesn't give you the kind of intimacy that you need. And then number three, what's interesting, number three is that when you share good feelings to one another, like funny experiences together. You know, if I have time, I will allow you to break into different groups and start having you guys share some hilarious and some embarrassing moments that you have had in your life. And first, they have nothing to say, but you know, when I allow people to do it, they end up sharing so much that I have a hard time stopping them. But, but, but for me, when I see people sharing good feelings, sharing embarrassing moments in their lives and making others, you know, happy and laughing a lot. And when you laugh a lot together, it brings people together. And when I, when I see people laughing together, you know, just like just having great time to one another, it is such a beautiful sight. When I see couples, it amazes me. When I see some couples sitting down, just being quiet, and being so stone-faced. It hurts my heart. But sometimes, you know, not often times, sometimes when I go to the airport and I see these couples coming together and they're laughing, they're giggling, they're like, like going crazy, and then, man, what is there to laugh about that much? But it's a beautiful sight. And so that's why in our relationship with our children, you know, we need to have a lot to laugh about. Because Christian life is a life of joy. You know, fruit of the Holy Spirit is love and then what? You see, love and joy. So there is only one fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, and then love gets manifested in the number one. The number one way that the love gets manifested is in the form of what? Joy. Joy is not only our privilege, it is our duty as Christians. We have a duty to have joy. 
Uh, we don't have time to talk about it. We're going to talk about it more uh, Friday night. We're going to talk about joy. I want you to be there. But let me tell you, you know, one of the best things that ever happened in my life by coming to the United States was to uh, not only marry my wife, but was to be a youth pastor. Even though it was so hard to be a youth pastor, you know, I had to like find ways to making it interesting for our church members, for young people. Because young people would not listen to you unless it's interesting, right? You know, I cannot come up to you and say, well, today, let me have a very serious talk with you guys. And no one listens. So every day, every day of the week, I would like wreck my brain out to find something funny to say. And you know what? I came to realize that even though our lives are so broken, even though our lives are so serious, life is hilarious. If you know how to look at it, if you have the eyesight of God to see life as if you are the third person looking at it, it is so hilarious. Let me tell you one hilarious story about a father and son who went fishing. This Korean father, Koreans. Especially Koreans are hilarious. I'm sure you guys have all have that hilarious side. You, you need to start looking at life hilarious because one day I couldn't go to sleep because somebody was fighting. It was a Hispanic couple who was nothing against Hispanic family. Okay? There was a Hispanic couple fighting. I didn't understand. I didn't know anything about Hispanic other than Uno. <laughs> Or numero. <laughs> and then what's so funny was about it is it was after 11 o'clock and then they were fighting and then they were using this word a lot that was uno, 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 uno. And I was getting this hunch that they were talking about who started first. They were talking about you started first. No, 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 no. You was ang you were angry first. No, no, no. You you were angry first. So they were talking like oh, no, oh, no, going crazy. I almost wanted to go out and say, stop using the word oh, no. Korean father and son, they went fishing. And you know, if you have gone ocean fishing, especially on a like a rubber boat. It gets pretty choppy. And then and then you get kind of seasick and nothing was coming, fishing was not going very well. And all of a sudden you get seasick and you vomit and all the fishes come. Whoa. Anyway, this son was getting seasick and he was like a typical Korean father was telling him. Hey, you're a man. You're a man. You shouldn't get sissy. You know, be patient and endure. <laughs> Don't be overcome. And then the son was out of obedience. Was like, and then he got adjusted. He got over it. And all of a sudden, father became quiet. And the father was going like this. <laughs> And then son wanted to like repeat the same words, <laughs> but he couldn't do it. <laughs> and he was just like laughing crazy. I'm saying this because despite of the fact that life is crazy, we do some crazy things in our relationship. If you know how we fight, let me tell you one secret. I mean, my wife and I, we, we got along pretty well. But she grew up here, I grew up in Korea. She came to the United States when she was eight and I came to the United States when I was 22. Talking about like cultural barrier, language barrier and all that stuff was going on. And we got cheated by each other. I thought she was more Korean than she was and she thought I was more American than I was. So at least that made it even. But we had some hilarious fights in the, you know, she was like, I wanted to go and then I was hiding all the keys. <laughs> Looking back, it was just hilarious. And so I began to look at life differently. God gave me a new eyesight. 
And then one day I went to church and I was preaching. And then I mispronounced the word. And I ended up saying the word like, veggie booger. And then kids were laughing crazy when I used the word veggie booger. And I didn't know what booger was. I didn't know why people were laughing at me crazy. I got so offended. Isn't it so hilarious? I got so offended because I was so ignorant. And then on the way home, I was telling my wife, Joe, I don't think I'm going to do ministry anymore. She asked me what happened. I said, you know, as soon as I used the word, uttered the word veggie booger, and then she started to laugh crazy. And I want to tell you, one thing I learned out of 20 years of youth ministry, out of 20 years of working with young people, out of 20 years of being in the United States, living my faith, is that God is a God of joy. Amen? God is a God of joy. And God wants us to be, God wants us to be connected in that way. You see, that's why, you know, Tony Campalo, I don't know if you know Tony Campalo, one of the greatest communicators. I mean, he's old now, but still great. And then it's an Italian family. Whenever he comes home, his father always asks him, you know what, tonight, before you have dinner, everyone has to say something funny. With, if not, you don't get dinner. So on the, on the way home, he was just like pulling his hair out to find something funny things to say. And he said, that's how he lost all of his hairs. <laughs> Having the sense of humor, being able to look at life in such a way that you look at it from a compassionate eyes changes everything. Changes everything. To be stressed out, to win over our children by pressing them down, by killing their spirit, by destroying their dignity. Hey, oh, I feel good. I won. I'm a father. I'm a... Man, that is so foolish and so stupid and so unwise. That's not the way. And then the fourth one is transparency. When you open up your heart, you see, when you open up your heart to your wife, when you open up to your children, when you open up to your church members, to somebody whom you do not know, and when you are able to talk about your addiction, you talk about your weaknesses, talk about your vulnerability without feeling ashamed. Did you hear what I said? being able to talk about your witness without feeling ashamed. I have a lady, Hispanic lady, another Hispanic lady, who, who used to come to our church. I forgot her name. She used to come to our church, always come to our church. And right after church, she always go to this one meeting. Little did I know that she has been attending this meeting for the past 20 some years. And it's called AA. Alcoholic Anonymous. She was a recovering alcoholic. Did you know that once you're an alcoholic, you're an alcoholic forever? I mean, you're always in the place of recovering, needing God, needing one another. And this is what she said. Pastor, I hate to tell you this, but if I have a choice between church and AA, I would go to AA. That really made me to rethink about the whole thing. And you know why? She said, whenever I go to church, I always feel like I have to be better. I have to do better than where I am. Whenever I go to AA, I am accepted the way I am, that that makes me want to be better, want to do better. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so there was a funeral for her. There was a funeral for her. And I was a presiding pastor. 
and then the funeral home was open from 5 o'clock. But the meeting, funeral program was not starting until 7 o'clock. Guess what happened? All the people who has been part of her AA group came even before 5 o'clock. And they just stay put, be present with her. Even after everybody come and leave, leave, they left after the program, they stayed till the end just to be there with her. Because everyone in the AA group said, we're going to miss her greatly. No one can replace her. We just want to be here to feel her presence. She has changed our lives. Everyone, everyone needs that kind of acceptance. Everyone needs a place where you can be so safe to be who you are. I have a gentleman, elder of a church, for the past 20, 30 years, he came up to me, felt so secure, felt so safe, and he came up to me, and Pastor, I want to tell you, you are the first one to know that I have been addicted to pornography for the past 30 years. I have great darkness in my life. I didn't know what to do with it. But I'm coming to you because I feel safe to tell you. I was telling that gentleman, I was telling that elder, I honor you, I respect you for your courage to be real, to take off your mask and to come and just be yourself. And I want you to know that God accepts you in your brokenness, in your inadequacy, in your incompleteness. I hope that this week we would get away from being a pastor, we would get away from being an elder, we would get away from being who you are in your society, in your family, your standing, whatnot. I hope that we would be human once again. That means we would be open. We would long to be vulnerable. We would long to share our weaknesses without feeling judged, without feeling condemned, or without feeling ashamed. You remember a lady who came to Jesus? She was brought to Jesus by Pharisees, and Pharisees were strict on rules, and they were the one who was bending rules. Simon was famous for that. She cheated, you know, with uh, Mary, and you, you know the story, and Mary became crazy, and she met the Lord, and then she came to Jesus, and then this lady came, she might have been Mary. She might have been Mary, this woman who came. She was ready to be stoned. And on a sand, she started writing words. Looked at Simon. Extramarital affair. Looked at somebody else, and she, she just started writing everything, writing all the sins of these people. Everybody left, and she was left by herself. And Jesus goes, I want you to look around to see if there's anybody. Lord, there's nobody. She said, Neither do I condemn you. Being in that vulnerable place. Have you ever been vulnerable? Have you ever been so broken? To a point where you lose hope and you become despair and depressed. And the weight of sin is heavy on you. I hope that this week you can come to Jesus without having to worry about anybody else. Just come to Jesus and embrace Him in your life. It happened to me in my 40s too. I realized that I was so broken. I thought I was PK, perfect kid, pastor's kid. I realized my own brokenness. And one day, middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning, I remember being in that big house, but that big house was like a hell. And it was like a thick, thick, thick,
thick, thick, dark cloud was hovering and covering my family. It was the darkest moment of my life. I didn't know what to do with myself, what to do with my family, what to do with the brokenness that, that I had experienced. I remember that 12 o'clock in the morning, I came to God. I just became literally prostrated before God. God, I don't know what to do with my life. I'm at the end of my own rope. Did you know that God's address is at the end of the rope? It's called at the end of the rope. Matthew chapter 5. He says, If you're hungry in your spirit, you will meet God. I will feed you. That being hungry in the spirit, being poor in spirit, original word, it means at the end of the rope. I want you to know tonight that if you feel like you're at the end of the rope, Jesus is there, God is there, He's embracing you. He's at that vulnerable spot being transparent with you and just wants to heal you right there where you are. Amen? I could only cry out to God. Have you ever cried out to God? I could only cry out to God. God, help me! That's all I could pray for. I could hear God answering my prayers. And learning to become a new man in God. In my own brokenness. Amen? God accepts us in our brokenness. He never leaves us in our brokenness. But tonight, I want to share you with this, and I'm going to end my talk tonight. The deepest level of communication is not sharing good feelings, because you can only share your good feelings so much. You can only share your vulnerable experiences, feelings so much. And yet, the deepest level of communication occurs in number five when you learn to share insights when you learn to share your experiences with your lessons when you learn to share your heartfelt understanding and heartfelt feelings and heartfelt compassions and understanding for one another then then communication gets deepest and that's where you meet God and that's where you meet one another and that's what, where God resides and that's why I was telling you we're made to be connected spiritually spiritually what makes communication most powerful is when you and I have this God moment and spiritual connection to each other, spiritual communication with each other. When I say spiritual, I'm not just talking about talking about God. I'm not just talking about talking about the Bible, but I'm talking about being real, talking about sharing your life experience and insight that you gain and the lessons that you learn from your failures and from your brokenness. When you learn to share that with with one another, you become intimately bonded more than you can possibly imagine. Amen? We're made to be bonded in that way. And that's why it is a spiritual pursuit. I'm going to end with these thoughts. I want you to know tonight that all of us are very, very precious here. And I want you to know tonight that we are here to exercise something very, very special. I, I don't want us to be so casual, but I, wanna, I, wanna just, I, want, I want for us to do something very special tonight before we go. As I close my meeting with you tonight, I want us to do something very special. As the Spirit leads you, I'm going to give you five minutes, five or six minutes or so. And I want you to stand up and I want you to go with somebody, okay? Whom you know, whom you may not know. And I want you to go to somebody and share something from your heart. That I was telling this young gentleman and said, you know what? You coming to church. When I started the church, I started with you. And you're the only one I could depend on. And guess how it has grown? Now we have six people because God has used you. God has started something. It is the beginning of something great. You remember? Can you imagine what that 
is doing to that person. Pastor Urbright, there's a famous pastor. When he was a teenager, he came to church with jeans. At that time, everyone was coming with the nice clothes, and he came with the jean. And then, you know, right before the message was over, he was ready to go. But pastor is a God moment. You see, whenever you are impressed by God to share something, don't hesitate to share. And so this pastor was supposed to pray, and he was being led by God. Guess what happened? He allowed somebody else to pray. When the spirit works, you got to respond. So he allowed somebody else to pray. And then he just went out. And he was led by the Holy Spirit to go out to meet this guy who was ready to leave right before the prayer. Pastor Albright. And this pastor, without knowing anything, being led by the Holy Spirit, you're talking about intimacy. You're talking about bonding. You're talking about sharing some insights. You know, Holy Spirit gives those things to me, to us. And so he went and he shook hand of this guy with the jean and said, Thank you for visiting this church. I know God is leading your life. And then he said, One day, you'll make a great pastor. Did you know that that became a self-fulfilling prophecy and he became a pastor? One day I had a church member who was bickering, who was criticizing me and criticizing me as, as a male chauvinist. <laughs> I had a hard time taking it. <laughs> and then I was praying to God and I was like, God, please remove that girl from our church or change her. I can't take her any longer. And I said, God says, well... Let me change you first. God definitely changed me. And one day, Lord gave me that impression. Lord gave me that insight about that person. So I went to her and said, You know what? You're very objective. You have a tremendous analytical ability. You, are, you, have a, you know how to think critically. I think, even, when, when, even as I was saying it, I couldn't believe my ears because, you know, I'm talking about a girl who is so negative, critical, and all that. But Holy Spirit is putting words in my mouth, and as I was saying it, I couldn't believe it. And I told her, you know what, one day, I think you will make a great counselor. In my mind, I was thinking, I'll never go to her Guess what happened? She became a counselor. <laughs> She's greatly being used by God. You can forget about everything that I've shared tonight. One thing I want you to remember is that we are made to be bonded with God, bonded with one another in that deep, spiritual, intimate way. Holy Spirit is an agent who could do that. Let me end with a story about Sherry Peters. There's a lady who was on the street. That's why I love doing street ministry. I love meeting with street people. I love meeting with these workers waiting in front of U-Haul. I love these kind of people. Because when you meet these people, you meet life in a raw form. And it, it's real. I mean, they don't lie. They don't cheat. I met a guy. Guess what? I met a guy who helped us to move. I was, you know, I already scheduled somebody to help us to move. And then this guy didn't show up. So I went to U-Haul and then I had to pick up somebody. And then I was about to come and these two gentlemen was coming, were coming to me and then they ended up being hired for that day. And then at the end of the day, I was coming home being tired with these two guys sweating and everything. And then this guy was talking about Shabbat, talking about Sabbath. I said, hey, what do you know about the Sabbath? He said, he came from Honduras, took him seven days to cross the border, 
went through so much, he paid so much money to get directed, and while he was sleeping, the guy who was paid to lead him was gone with the rest. <laughs> while he was in you know, the border of Guatemala or somewhere, it was deep dark. Deep darkness covered the whole earth, and it was just forest area, and you could only see the forest. And he was just shivering with fear because he could hear the voice sounds of animals. And he was not a Christian. And he was telling me he could only pray. Jehovah, please help me. <laughs> he heard the name Jehovah. Jehovah, please, Yahweh, please help me. Guess what happened? There's a reason why this guy was not awakened by the leader. Because the guy who was paid to lead and the group that he went with, that everybody else who went with, they got caught. And this guy not knowing anything, he was just like shivering through the forest and then he ended up opening the last portion of the forest and then there was Guatemala. He came to Guatemala that way. And he came to the United States. And you know what? And then all that long journey, after that all that long journey, he was, he's learning about Seventh-day Adventism. He's becoming Seventh-day Adventist. Let me tell you a story about this one lady, the street lady who became Seventh-day Adventist. One day, she was just she was so pissed off with life, didn't know what to do with her life. She was already molested by motorcycle gangs and all that stuff. Talking about God coming to us, talking about God bringing intimacy. And this lady ended up walking down the street in Tennessee. One Adventist lady came. She was driving, 80 years old. This lady was driving. And she ended up noticing this lady who was ready to just die. I mean, you know, lost everything, all energy. Opened the window, embracing her. And guess what happened? The 80 year old, this lady said, and a sad dad, but this lady <laughs> said, I want you to come to our house. Only condition I would give you is for you to study the Bible with me. And then she gave Bible study every day. And Sherry Pierce said that was one of the most boring Bible studies she ever had because she would just read the portions of the scripture. And then amazing thing was that at the end of one month, she had this God moment in her life. And then from top to bottom, she felt the Holy Spirit just touching her and then allowing her to be healed. And I want you to know tonight that we are made to be connected with God. And in God, we are made to be connected to one another in such a way that we become intimate and intimately bonded in Christ. Amen.